This month's Where Did the Road Go is brought to you by eight amazing people. Greg Ross, Illuminati, Allison Cook, Super Inframan, 36 Dingo, Michael Fritschke, Dr. O in Teberg, and Doug Malam. Thank you all so very much for helping make this show possible. Transmission start. Welcome to Where Did the Road Go? Join us as we wander off the path and explore lost history, consciousness, the paranormal, unexplained mysteries, alternative thought, and much more. We are present on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com. Now here is your host, Soraya. Welcome to this edition of Where Did the Road Go? And tonight I have, for the first time with me, Tilly Treadwell. How are you doing? Hello. I am doing a very well. Magical morning or merry midnight, wherever, whenever you may be around the world or across the dimensions. I am Tilly Treadwell, and it's a pleasure to be here with Soraya. And uh, you, you are out of Florida, correct? You got it. I am live with you from my cottage in Lake Mary, Florida. Um, I don't know where Lake Mary is off the top of my head. Are you anywhere near Gulf Breeze? That rings exactly zero bells for me. Okay. I'm very sorry okay. to say. <laughs> but- we are closer to perhaps Orlando. We're about 35 minutes or so from Orlando. Okay. Gulf, Gulf Breeze, there was a series of uh, UFO sightings in Gulf Breeze back in the late 80s, I think. Oh, interesting. I, I admit I have not heard of that, but as as I was telling you a little earlier, I'm a I'm a newbie to the uh, <laughs> to the UFO scene. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Um, I just know I know it's along the coast. I'm not even familiar with exactly where it is because honestly, I've never looked it up. I just know the the stuff that happened there. So, um, but you've had, you've had an entire lifetime of experiences. I have, and man, has it been a ride. I'm actually really excited because, um, Tim Swartz, Zontar Press, and our friends over there were working on a brand new book about time slips and time anomalies, where I am writing about my lifetime full of experiences starting at about the age of three years old. That's, that's how long I've been experiencing these things. And, uh, I'm glad now that society has shifted to where people won't think that I'm, (laughs) I'm a total nut job. (laughs) Well, (laughs) at at least less people will. Yes. Yeah. A a little, a little bit less of the, uh, crazy accusations hopefully will be coming my way. (laughs) (laughs) Um, so what was the experience at three years old? Sure. I started off early um, experiencing what now I know to be called the Mandela effect or retconning, if you're familiar. I think everyone's heard of the Mandela effect in general, so I don't think I have to really explain that. But so (laughs) my my family of origin, they are Irish and German immigrants, and they are of the old, old world. My grandmother, bless her soul, she had this beautiful old mantle clock and it had the classic Roman numerals. And when I was just a tot, my mother was holding me in her arms and I looked at the clock because I've always been fascinated with clocks. And so I studied this clock, whether I was down on the ground looking up at the mantle or I was in my mother's arms, I would be looking at this clock because I just loved it. And I was staring at it and I looked away for just a few seconds. Um, I, I forget exactly what happened to make me to make me look away, but when I looked back, I remember seeing a few of the numerals had changed. And it actually startled me quite a bit because for a while I had been tugging on my mother's uh, on my mother's clothes and begging someone to teach me about what the numerals on the clock meant because I didn't understand what a clock was exactly yet. And um, they were of the generation where children should be seen and not heard, you know, that mm. kind of thing. So no one really ever educated me on it. So for me to see the clock change, I was excited about this and nervous and I didn't understand. 
So I was jumping up in her arms and tugging and trying to tell her what was going on. And I know what I saw and it stuck with me all of these years later. That was my first experience ever with witnessing the Mandela effect. And then I want to say within the the next year, I was in the car seat in the back of the car and I was interested in what the hanging lights were, the traffic lights. Yeah. And I specifically remembered that the green was on top and then it was yellow and then red at the bottom. And I remember, again, looking away for a moment and then looking back up and it switched. The red was on top and then the green was on the bottom. And again, Mm. I would try to tell my mom about it and she just completely dismissed me. Oh, you've got an active imagination, you know, that kind of thing. Sure. And uh, yeah, that was my introduction to (laughs) this magical, magical world. What, what? When you say the clock changed, what, what, what exactly happened? Okay. So, for example... You know the nu- the Roman numeral four. Mm-hmm. Um, it can be either four individual I's, right? Or it can be I V. Yeah. And it switched from I forget which one, but it switched from one to the other, almost oh. right in front of my face. Huh. Interesting. And then I know that there was another one on the clock that changed at the same time. I think it was nine, if I remember properly. Okay. So kind of a, yeah. What did the nine change from to? Um, it, I can't remember if it changed from IX to, oh, what is it? To, to V with four ones. It was mm. something like that. Huh. Okay. But don't, but don't quote me on that because. You were three. I went to yeah that too <laughs> i had i went to a birthday party earlier today for my friends for a friend and i am i'm a little tired right now so i hope you can forgive me <laughs> <laughs> okay and again you were also three so the fact that you even remember that is impressive to me well thank you uh <laughs> i am as i as i explained earlier i'm diagnosed as being neurodivergent uh they're not sure exactly what's what's going on there it's something like autism but not quite yet uh so it seems like i i do have a lot of memory way back towards infancy that a lot of people don't have and i was shocked to learn that a lot of people don't have um detailed memory of young childhood i didn't realize that until somewhat recently yeah yeah i uh actually one of the questions i would ask people on my music show when they came on is what was their earliest memory? And most people just kind of go blank and they're like, I, I don't know. And then, you know, the the average is maybe around three years old that they, they start to remember something, but they'll just have one snippet of memory. Wow. Okay. My first memory is being in the little tiny um, baby carrier that has the handle. Mm. And, and I've heard people like, say stuff like that. And usually they're neurodivergent. They do, it, memory works different. Oh, wow. Okay. So I'm not quite as alone as maybe is what I thought. But I I think most people don't remember that far back, but when you do, you really do. Yes. So that's, that's interesting. So, uh, so the Mandela effect was kind of, what did you call it? Retconning? Yes. Yep. So where does that term come from? Oh, goodness. Uh, (laughs) It's a specific scientific term from what I understand, but for me, uh, I am a millennial. Reddit is a thing, (laughs) and there is there is a Reddit board called R slash Retcon, R E T C N, and that's where I know it from. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Mm Not as professional and scientific as a response of a response as I had hoped, but eh, I'm honest. (laughs) That's fine. It just uh, I I I may have heard someone call it that before. Usually, I just hear it called the Mandela effect. Gotcha, gotcha. It's interesting because in Reddit world, there's a culture around the (laughs) around the Mandela effect. So, a lot of the newbies who are just figuring out what the Mandela effect is, and maybe they're seeing it for the first time. They always seem to find the r slash Mandela effect boards. But then those of us who are more seasoned or more serious about it, we we always go over to the r slash retcon or the r slash glitch in the matrix boards. Right. Mm-hmm. I uh, The thing with a lot of them, some of them I think are just bad memories. Uh, I agree. Our, our memories are, ver- are really not good, and most people think our memories are perfect. 
So there are certain things where it's like, okay, I think you're just not remembering it right, or you assumed it and never questioned it until someone pointed it out. But then there's things that don't make sense. And mm-hmm. you go, no, this, this doesn't make sense like this. That Why would it not be the other way? I completely agree. And then I find it interesting that there are many of of these examples where there are thousands, maybe millions of people who are having the exact same memory. Yeah. I find that intriguing. Absolutely. And that that's the thing when so many people are like, no, th- this, no this happened. And it's like, the, that person's still alive? What do you mean that person's still alive? Mm-hmm. <laughs> But, uh, did you hear that Bob Barker um, allegedly passed away recently? Did he not? Well, no, he apparently did. But for me, he already passed away two other times. Ah, uh, okay. Mm-hmm. See, see, to me, if I were to say that, I'd be like, I'm just remembering wrong. I know my memory's <laughs> not great, especially with stuff like that. So I'd just be like, oh, they're still alive. Oh, no, they're not anymore. Okay. D- I didn't know they still were. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I completely agree, except that, at least for me, I have vivid memories of seeing uh, the headlines and whatnot several years ago, Mm -hmm. two other times. And I I would say the other issue, and I'm not not saying you you didn't, I'm not not dismissing your experience, Mm -hmm. but the other issue with social media is that you get so many fake headlines. Yes, you are right. Especially about celebrities dying. I mean, that's a whole type of spam that you have to fight with on, on pages and stuff on Facebook. Oh, this person's ill and dying, and it's it's none of it's real. But if you're just scrolling through, you might be like, oh, that person died. That sucks. You know, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I completely agree with you, and I would dismiss this, too, if I hadn't seen it all over the um, the major news right, right. outlets as well as uh, the obituary and whatnot, because I, I research these things. So whenever I see that a celebrity has died, I take notes on things like that because I've had several, at least for me, that have died, quote unquote, several times. And hmm. so... <laughs> still kind of still kind of uh catches my eye well that's interesting mm-hmm. that, that's i've never thought of uh oh i i guess with the consistency if you're having this stuff happen enough it makes sense to do that right yeah huh. okay. i uh i keep a journal actually of things that that happen typically speaking anyways because it, it does tend to happen pretty frequently and then i i have my my dear husband <laughs> who experiences a lot of this stuff with me and I have the benefit actually of getting both my experience and then his as well. And uh, that definitely helps for me to kind of approach life in a, in a more scientific, open-minded way. And I, I find it all fascinating. So after those experiences, what was the next type of things that started happening to you? Mm-hmm. Uh, I I started having experiences in my grandma's garden with fairies. Oh. Mm -hmm. Now, were they traditional fairies or like uh, the the, the more modern take on fairies? I'm not entirely sure. Okay. And I think if I explain what I saw a little bit, you might understand a little why. Okay. So, to set the scene, I was born here in Lake Mary, Florida. But my family, as I said, German immigrants, many of them, a lot of them settled up in the more northern states. So you could say like uh, Pennsylvania, Indiana, Ohio, New York, just it's a smattering. Mm -hmm. And in one of these states, my maternal grandmother had settled and she was a proud gardener. She absolutely loved her little northern garden. She had butterfly bushes. She had tons of herbs like thyme and lemongrass she had everything and then she had lots and lots of flowers and chives and she mulched it herself she kept everything spick and span it was just glorious well i would often be up north with my family and i would stay many nights at my grandma's house and i i have always loved being up at night and in the early morning So one night I got up and I was wandering my grandma's house because I'm just creepy like that. And I just like to be up at night. No, I I, I understand that completely. 
Yes, yes. I was actually pretty delighted, honestly, when you recommended a phone call at 10 p.m. <laughs> Good. Yep, yep. So I was wandering the house and I went out to the kitchen. The kitchen had a window that overlooked the garden area. And I had been hearing some faint, what kind of sounded like dreamy, fluty music, I guess you could say. And I looked out this window in the little breakfast nook attached to the kitchen that overlooked the garden. And I could see these lights, these kind of sparkling little lights. They, but they would fade in and out from like a, a glow to a light and back and forth. And it was kind of glittery and a light gold color. But if I looked more closely at these little dancing lights, and when I say little, they were no more than maybe like four inches tall amongst her little row of lemon grass and whatnot. And I looked more carefully through the window, focusing my eyes because I could I could see just enough with how much light these things were giving off. And they would change back and forth between these little figures of they looked like little humans. But then they would go back to lights and then they go back to little humans. But then some of them were like little tiny animals. Hmm. So it was very strange. Um, oh, have you ever seen the Victorian postcards that show animals wearing like waistcoats and whatnot? Yes. Okay. That is literally what I saw. Hmm. That's interesting. Yes. <laughs> and for a long time, I didn't tell people about, about this experience because sure. I didn't want to be seen as nutsy. But, <laughs> I mean, it's a new world, so why not, right? Well, these little animals and humans slash lights, all of them, some of them were just little tiny naked like animals. Some of them were tiny animals like frogs and tiny birds wearing clothing, but really fancy clothing and mm -hmm. the little humans were essentially naked but they were all dancing with each other in a circle holding hands and going back and forth and then sometimes letting go and continuing the dance and um, I couldn't see anyone playing any instrument and yet there was music they didn't have any lanterns or anything yet there was bright lights they weren't within a snow globe and yet there was glitter all around. And it was one of the most interesting experiences that I've ever had. And I've I've had other experiences with with those um with those particular fairies as well as fairies in a local park when I was around that age. And how old was that? I was about four. Okay. Okay. Wow. Four or five. Mm-hmm. Lights are one of the most common thing you find throughout paranormal experiences. Um, and one of the things I've said for a long time, you see a light in a house and people are like, oh, it's a ghost. You see a light in, you know, out in a garden and it's a fairy or, you know, it's Bigfoot or you see a light in the sky and now it's an alien. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? I I personally have experienced lights with almost every type of non-human interaction that I've yeah. ever had. I, I, I suspect they're a core part of whatever this thing really is. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think we ever see it for what it is. Uh, uh, maybe light is probably the closest we get to seeing. So I wonder if, you mm -hmm. know, we, so we put, you know, some detail into there because our brains just don't know what we're dealing with. I do think that that could be part of it. What I have been told by a few of the contacts that I've personally had, at least, again, I'm not saying this is, this is necessarily true. I'm just saying I could be crazy or I could be onto something. So I don't want anyone to, to take this necessarily as gospel. Um, yet, what I have been told by some of my, my non-human interactions with these people, I don't call them creatures. I don't call them beings. I see them as people. Um, they told me that a lot of the time when they are coming through, they are fading in and out between what human human people would call corporeal. So we would call it having a body, being physical, being corporeal. And we would typically say, oh, the fairies and the jinn are either semi-corporeal or non-corporeal. When really, in my understanding, it's they have bodies. It's just different density. And right. it's made up of different material. So what they told me is that when they're coming through and they're 
becoming more physical to enjoy the physical realm for a while, they can't hold that form very well, nor they can they hold it forever. So they they go back and forth in vibration, yeah. if that makes sense. No, it totally and does. So, yeah. So their form shifts from light to the more physical interpretation of what it would be to light and back and forth and back and forth. And they'll enjoy being here in the physical for a while or like the, the denser reality, the 3D. And then eventually they go back to their own density where they just become, quote unquote, a ball of light again. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, no, totally. And, and I think there's some co-creation aspects to that as well. Like our expectations sort of guide what they become here. I completely agree. Um, a big aspect that I keep bumping into, whether it's when I work with the djinn or when I work with the fairies, quote unquote, or with other types of people, they say that a lot of the time they take certain opportunities to come into the physical in order to align themselves with certain timelines or opportunities that intersect with the human timelines or opportunities in order to fulfill a certain event that is needed to happen for a certain story to be forwarded or come true. Does hmm. that make sense? Yeah. It, it reminds me of uh, uh, Dr. Kripal's comment that I love where he said the, the paranormal happens, or I, he calls it the supernatural. He doesn't like paranormal. The supernatural <laughs> happens in people's lives for a reason. And in that case, he was talking about why it's hard to replicate in labs, but that's basically what you're saying. Like, it's, it's, there, it's there to fulfill a purpose. Yes. Yep. That's what I've been taught, actually, by if what I'm saying is, is true, because I do believe it's true. So if what I'm saying is true, that's what I've been told by my own um, non-human friends and contacts and whatnot. And so they see it as extremely spiritual and sacred to show up at certain times doing certain things. And it's kind of like a sacred dance for them or a sacred game. And I like that quite a lot. Mm, okay. That's does, interesting. Does that make sense? Uh, Paul Kimball had come up with the idea that we're dealing with one thing that likes to manifest in our reality, almost like an art project. Mm -hmm. That's quite literally what I've been told and that it all comes in, in different flavors. They wear different masks yes, to fulfill yeah. different stories. Well, yeah. And, and when you go, like I said, you have lights that, that go across all these experiences, but you have other things too like poltergeist activity that, that tend to, you know, if someone sees a UFO, they go home and then they have poltergeist activity or they see Bigfoot and then, or they have poltergeist activity in the woods and they attribute it to Bigfoot. Um, obviously ghosts get connected to Bigfoot. People have near death experiences followed by poltergeist activity. So again, this is one of those things that, that suggests that this stuff isn't as separate as uh, some people think it is. Yep. I, I do agree Something that I've been taught, though, is to let those people be and not try to force them into believing that it is all connected and whatnot because they're living their own story. They're they're learning their own lessons. And oh, that's yeah. just as important. And so I try to just be like, OK, sure. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and that's the thing. Everyone's experience of reality is different. Mm -hmm. We're not all I don't think we're all here for the same exact reason. You know, so there's not one path. There's there's infinite paths. Amen, brother. I agree. <laughs> um, it's like you know, I've I've had atheist friends who are like, well, if you want me to believe any of this stuff, you'll have to prove it to me. And I'm like, I don't have to prove anything to you. Believe it if you want. Don't believe it if you want. I don't care. <laughs> That's that is true. That is true. I find it strange when people talk about um, believing something if they want to believe it i guess i have trouble i have trouble with that concept because um so for example if i'm looking at a piece of paper and one plus one equals two is written on that and then i can grab like one orange and then put another one beside it and see that it's two oranges i i don't i don't quite understand where wanting to believe would would come into right, some of this right yes it's so interesting to me how different life experiences can be. Well, and yes, that is it exactly. I mean, most of the people I know who are atheists never had anything weird happen to them, or they, if they did, it was minor and they were able to dismiss it. Mm -hmm. 
without affecting their worldview. And and I think a lot of times people like that are there. It's almost a fearsome worldview. Like they don't like the idea that we don't understand everything. Mm-hmm. So if you if you take it into that that sort of science, you put science as a religion in there, and you say, no, no, we got it all covered. We've explained everything, and now right. I feel safe. You know, now I feel comforted because we understand it all. Yeah, I I hear you on that. I've had a lot of similar experience with experiences with atheistic people. And then on the other side of the coin, I can't tell you how many people in the past that I've I've worked with and counseled, they've come to me begging for help. They're extremely religious and they're having terrifying experiences with the paranormal. Mm. And what I've come to believe is that we each choose our own adventure. And so for me, um, part of my mindset is that I don't know everything. And I think that I know only a fraction of a fraction right. of what's actually going on. But I, I love the mystery. I love the journey. And I do my best to just dance with whatever life is giving me at any given moment. I hope that makes a little bit of sense. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. There was, there was a point many years ago, I had uh, one of the big dreams. You know what I mean when I say big dreams versus little dreams? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So one of the big dreams I had, I ended up in a library and there was this being there and he, he handed me six books and he said, in here is everything you could ever want to know. And I was very yeah. excited about this and I picked up the first book and I opened it up and it interestingly connected to things that I ended up looking into and, and uh, connected to me starting the show, but... I, I looked through it for a moment, and then I closed the book and handed it back to him. I said, I don't want the answers like that. I want to figure them out. Aww. And when I came back from that, I was like, no, that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. Oh, wow. Well, then we must be soul siblings because I've had, I've had similar dreams. Really? Mm-hmm. And what were, you, what were yours like? Mine were not including books. Okay. Mine, mine have always been that I was in a classroom with a bunch of other people and every single one of us had something very special on top of our heads. So for me, in a lot of my dreams, I had a pearl headband, a small pearl headband on my head. And then other people had like a flat brim, a flat brim hat, or they would have some type of scarf or something. And we were all there. And then, then there was a really grand teacher at the front of the room. And we were all there as divine students. And at the end of, of the classes, the teacher would typically say something like, or co- not say, like communicate telepathically, something to the effect of, and if you have any questions about life, I will be happy to grant you what it is you would like to know to take back to earth with you. And I felt, I remember feeling extremely excited and relieved and happy about it. But then I would just kind of shut myself down with logic, thinking that, well, I agreed to go there and do it in a logical, grounded way, to do it the harder way, to get that full human experience. And so each time I was offered, I would decline, and then I'd wake up. Hmm. Yeah, I I think life would be a lot less interesting without mystery. Oh, gosh, I totally agree. And I'm sure the answers are not what we think they are. So if you did come back with all the answers and told everyone, no one would believe you. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. (laughs) And that right there, I just, whatever. I'll just keep my wacky ideas that I've got here (laughs) within myself. I'll I'll shout them out to whoever wants to hear them and whatever. (laughs) So now now you said you had a near-death experience sometime recently, right? Oh my goodness. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Uh, That was in April of this year. Oh, wow. So very recently. So tell us about that. Sure. Uh, Well, I have been battling some some pretty serious malnutrition and hormonal issues and and, uh, some organ issues for Mm. quite a while. And unfortunately, it had been unchecked. And then I was working too hard, working too much. You know how that goes. And I just... um, the one day I was not at all feeling well. I felt, I, I just felt essentially worse, seemingly just out of the blue. So I told my husband, hey, I'm not feeling well this evening. I'm going to go lay down. And I did. I went and lay, lay down in bed and I fell asleep, or at least I, I felt like I fell asleep. At some point, 
I started hearing the most beautiful, I'm going to say it's it was guitar music, but it was far smoother, lovelier, more beautiful than any guitar I've ever heard here on earth. It also it had such a rich tone to it that words are truthfully failing me to describe its its absolute beauty. And joining with this quote unquote guitar was the most gorgeous feminine voice I have ever had the pure honor to hear. Mm -hmm. It was all in perfect, absolute harmony. And it filled my my head, my hearing, everything. And then I felt strangely aware. Um, and I was kind of, I felt my body buzzing. And it didn't make sense. But then all of a sudden, I was in this black velvet type of bubble. I can't even call it a room because it was circular. And the thing is, I wasn't, I wasn't in my body anymore. I had no hands. I had no eyes physically. I had nothing. I was just my pure consciousness in this velvet bubble. And I wasn't technically touching the velvet on the, the lining of the bubble. But I just knew that it was the, the loveliest, thickest, richest velvet in any existence. And the singing and the music continued and this woman's voice came into my mind and and said that i had a choice whether to go or to stay and she essentially was telling me that if i chose to stay i had another uh year of healing to do but that i could stay if i really wanted to or i could go home and they could find a better suited incarnation for me. Hmm. And she wound up saying that my team of guardians, let's just call them, was on the other side of that velvet room and that they would be responsible for taking me back to my body to restart and that they would take care of giving me the energy and the health to get things together further. And so I chose to stay and... She said, if you truly want to stay, you need to try to physically move because, you know, my energy was draining out. Yeah. And so I did. And it was the hardest thing that I've, I've honestly ever had to do because my whole body just felt strangely still and sluggish in a way that I've never experienced before. And then on top of this, her singing, her music, her presence... She she had the most loving presence I've I've ever encountered. And I I chose to stay because I had this agreement. I don't know exactly what the agreement is. I just know that I, I have it. So I need to be here and I need to try my best. And if I'm being offered help with my physical body, I want to take it and I want to make sure that I really do my best. Yeah, but it, it was hard. It was really, it was very difficult to um to come back because I could have, I could have um gone with her, and I think that she truly was the loveliest person I've ever met. Hmm. Can you describe it, the voice at all? Um, sure. It had it had a a higher feminine quality to it, and yet there was still a perfect tone and um. A richness, a vibrational richness to it. I don't know if that makes any kind of sense. No, it does. It does. Because we, we had talked on this show before. A lot of people tend to hear female voices. Really? Yes. Um, and we were wondering if it was strictly like, like if women heard male voices and, you know, vice versa. But no, it turns out female voices are very common. Uh, it doesn't mm -hmm. seem to, from, from what people have told me, I mean, some people hear male voices, definitely. Uh, and I have too, but most of the voices that have said anything to me have been female. Um, and it, it seems like it doesn't matter what gender you are, what uh, sexual orientation you are. So it doesn't seem to be like an anima animus type of thing. Um, but yeah, fe female voices are generally the more common one. Wow. Yeah, she, I, I'm, I believe that I met an angel mm. that evening. This is just my belief. Of course, I don't know. Maybe my, my brain made it all up. I really don't know. Maybe I am mentally ill. I have no idea. I mean, psychologists say that I'm perfectly fine, alarmingly so. <laughs> but <laughs> I, 
<laughs> I don't know. I admit that I don't know. And um, I, I hope that if, well, no, please let me rephrase. I hope that no matter if my dying brain made that up or if that was my guardian or if that was an angel or if that was quote unquote, you know, God, whatever, I do genuinely hope that she is there for me when it is actually my time. Yeah, maybe I hope she, to see. Maybe them. she's always there. You just don't have communication with her. And that is true. It very well could be. And I hope so because I, I greatly enjoyed my time with her. Now, so did you just wake back up then? It was the strangest thing. I, when I came back into my, my physical form, although my body, my lower body felt extremely sluggish, I had started off by trying to move my, my foot. I think it was my right foot at that time. It, that all felt really, really sluggish, sluggish, but my mind felt strangely renewed Mm. and I felt incredibly sleepy but all of my energy, physical, mental, came back pretty quickly, even though I was just feeling really sleepy. I didn't have any loss of strength or anything after like 10 seconds or so. But the music took a minute to fade away. Yeah. I Until I really sat up and was getting up out of bed, I still, I could hear the music fading away, her singing. And that instrument was slowly fading away. And I was so sad about that. And I got up and I went and I saw my husband on the other side of the house. And I stood in the doorway just for a second and I quietly watched him because I wanted to see, was he playing anything that I could have Mm. in like a fever dream or something mistaken for this type of experience? No, he had his headphones on. And he said that he was listening to some kind of lecture. Okay. So it was very interesting. It was probably one of the most unique, if not the most unique experience I've ever had. It was, it was realer than real. <laughs> right, right. And mm-hmm. I mean, you, so you can interpret that as an angel encounter. Someone else might interpret the same thing uh, as a fey encounter. Right, um, absolutely. So someone else would put even stronger religious tones on it. Because all mm-hmm. these things are elements of those things. Mm-hmm. I was on another show recently, and I had spoken about this seeming encounter that I had. And one of the gentlemen on the panel told me, because he, he works, he says, with Egyptian gods and goddesses and whatnot. He said that it was actually an Egyptian angel of death or goddess of death that had come to collect me. Yeah, I mean and that she would be very kind and she'd also be there the next time when it was actually my time. And I find that interesting because I have no connection whatsoever to anything Egyptian. No, but he does. So that's how he interpreted it. Right, right. And it could be true or, or not. I have no idea. <laughs> it's uh, the, the other quote I'm sure people are tired of hearing me, me recount, but it, it's so fitting. Uh, Crowley, Alistair Crowley once said about religion. He said, God is the same mountain, named different things by different people with different paths to the top, but it's still the same mountain. I like that, actually, and I've never heard that quote. Oh, yeah. my goodness. I'm, I'm paraphrasing it. I don't, it's not exactly how he put it, but that was he was a mountain climber, so that's why he used it as an analogy. Oh, oh I did not know that. Well, thank you for teaching me something new today. <laughs> So I, I, I think um, how we interpret this stuff isn't necessarily right or wrong. Um, one of the arguments I make when people say, well, you know, like they'll say, well, do you believe in this or do you believe in that? And I'm like, okay, I believe we're having an ex- that, that people are having these experiences. Now, their interpretations may not literally be what they are, mm-hmm. but they go back as far as written history is recorded and through every single human culture. So, right. so you can't say nothing's happening. We just may, you know, if you say, do you think aliens are visiting Earth? Okay, well, that that's one thing. But if you say, do people see strange things in the sky? Well, yes. Yes, they do. Exactly. I agree. I completely agree. And you talking about Crowley reminded me, I actually, I did have one experience with his, um, oh, what was his name? The blue alien thing. Oh, Lamb. Lam- Lam. Scared. Lamb, ever- yeah. Thing. Yeah, scared the ever-loving life out of me. And how did that happen? So, in my my hubby and I, there are times where, at least in the past, we're stopping this now. After this last encounter, we're we're not doing anything like this anymore. Um, among several other things, 
in the past, up until recently, this this happened in February. Okay. Sometimes we would smoke a little bit of hookah. And for anyone who's not familiar, it's not it's not marijuana. It's there are no hard drugs involved, anything like that. It's literally just flavored tobacco. And I do not endorse smoking. It was it was one of the the vices in general that I had um, because I love smoke. I love incense. I love flavored things. And yeah, you know, good fit. Okay. Well, we smoked some flavored hookah the one night, and we were. We were just up late listening to Indian music on TV, the sitar, Mm -hmm. and it was somewhere around, somewhere between three and four a.m. roughly. And my husband was lying in in the bed next to me, seeming to zone out, and I was just staring at the ceiling. The smoke was winding down, and out of the blue, I got an intense feeling that something was not right. Something was here to see me. And as you and I had talked about with neurodivergence and whatnot, um, I do believe that there is a strong, strong link between so-called paranormal activity and brain structure, as well as eye structure. Yeah. So for example, I've been told that my eye structure is a little bit different and it seems like I don't have the lens very thick that has that typically grows over people's eyes around the time of seven or eight. Oh. So I I see things and I started seeing in the pre what I call the pre physical. So it kind of looks like an overlay in a little tiny room, like an orb face. Have you ever seen that? I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Okay. It it started to come in like like that, and sometimes that's how something will appear. And I call it like a little reality room. Um, it's usually up and to the left or the right. Sometimes it's in my mind's eye. Sometimes I can physically see that something is there, and it's trying to come through. So. I'm sitting here, I'm starting to feel this weirdness in this darkened room while the Indian music is playing. I look over at my husband and he's zoning out. Um, he's, he, I reached over and I touched him and I asked him, are you okay? And he's like, you know, it's really funny that you ask me that because about five minutes ago, I started to get a really buzzy, strong feeling and it felt like I was um, about to have another ayahuasca trip out of the blue. And mm. so he said, I just was starting to go with it. And so I shook him. I'm like, you don't do that. You never do that. You didn't take ayahuasca. You have no idea what's going on. And now I had um, this face appearing in my, I think it was my upper right eyesight. And it's late at night. I don't entertain stuff like this typically at night because it's an invasion of my sacred hours. This thing at the time, I didn't really I didn't know about Crowley and like the skull experiments or anything like that. I was just learning about this, but it showed up and this this um, person said to me that he was putting my husband under and he wanted to talk to me privately. And he said that there were many of them who who had their issues with humanity and they wanted essentially me to assist them in coming through because at the time i was i was um dealing with some stuff with my own realizations about uh the world and how it works and whatnot and so i essentially said no hell no and get out you're not welcome never ever return you never approach me like that and you surely do not put my husband under like that that is a complete overstep and you are never to come back here And so I got up and I made sure that I had shaken my husband out of what was going on. I turned on all the lights in the house. I I wound up lighting incense. And by the time that this thing had been trying to come through, it was frightening to me because he, he had such a strong presence, such a dominating presence. It actually scared me. And I deal with this stuff all the time. I don't get scared easily. But this frightened me to the point where I I set new ground rules with my husband to prevent anything like this from ever happening again. So had you you two done ayahuasca before? Uh, Yes, we each did it. Well, I did it once and he did it twice. I wonder if the combination of uh, stuff you had going on could have set set off some endogenous DMT. 
And it really might have, to be honest with you. That was shortly before my NDE. And it had been within the the year, if not like six months or so, since doing that, um, since doing ayahuasca. For me, though, I had a brilliantly pleasant experience. I had a really soulful, happy experience. And my husband had a heck of a trip. But I don't know, it could have, it could have been a combination of any, any things. I just, I didn't expect it. And it honestly, it did terrify me. Okay. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, Now you you said your husband, you said your husband didn't really have experiences until you two got together. Mm, Yep. And so what was the, what was the first thing that happened there? (laughs) Well, on our first date, um, things weren't going too terribly well. We have very different personalities. Um, (laughs) So we didn't quite get along until I forget exactly what set it off, but I started getting just tons of intuitive information about him. Mm. And so I started asking him incredibly pointed personal questions that both intrigued him and freaked him out. Stuff that (laughs) no one could know unless they were remote viewing his house and or knew him extremely personally. And so from there, he was just absolutely blown away. And I, I think you may be able to tell from my photo, I'm, I'm typically a pretty bubbly, colorful person. And he had judged me as an airhead Mm. (laughs) and he was shocked to find out that perhaps that wasn't the case. (laughs) Well, plus, plus if you look really young too. Yes. Yep. And I did. I looked incredibly young. I looked, and I still look like a teenager today, I'm told. Um, but then I looked even, even younger. Um, so then did he start having spontaneous experiences or did his experiences were were they just shared with you? Mm -hmm. He actually, over the years, he's had a number of his own experiences separate of me. Most of his experiences are with me and I've, this has been a, a, a long-standing thing. A lot of the time when people spend a lot of time in my presence, they start experiencing things for themselves. Mm-hmm. And then a few of them have experienced things without me by their side. And I suspect that there's some type of energy that is rubbing off and either creating or attracting these types of beings and experiences. And again, I suspect that it it might be something energetic and or genetic. Are you, uh, are you aware of Kundalini energy? You know, I've heard the term before, but to to be honest, I really don't know much about it. I'm kind of Uh, embarrassed to say. (laughs) uh, No, that's okay. That's okay. But, um, I, I have a massive amount of, uh, Kundalini energy that just woke up on its own when I was a teenager. And it affects the people around me. And it, like my interactions with some people, it, there's no, no effect at all. Other people, it affects strongly. Uh, I, w- I suspect, I wouldn't be shocked, let's say, if I sent you, you know, like the show I did, a, a show I did on Kundalini, and you were like, oh, yeah, okay. Because um, <laughs> it, mm. it's probably some stuff you've experienced, judging from what you've said tonight. Um, huh? But, like, with me, mm-hmm. um, there are people that did not have experiences until they were around me a bunch. There are other people who don't, have, it doesn't do anything to them. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. and the people I really connect with, I always seem to have something different with them. Um, I had a friend, uh, I do a, a metal show as well that I've been doing forever. And early on, uh, this guy started coming up to the show and I, I he ended mm-hmm. up being like my first actual co-host. And, uh, he was just, he, he was a math, uh, guy at Cornell. So he was not, you know, the, the paranormal weird stuff that none of that. He didn't think anything like that existed. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had a friend of mine up one night, and for some reason, our connection allowed me to hear her questions for me before she said them. Oh, So I wouldn't wouldn't know she didn't ask me a question because I heard it in her voice, in my head. Mm -hmm. And it's the only, the thing is, the weird thing about this is like, that's the only person that's ever happened with. Okay. But he was he was there one night and she's there one night and she's where he and I are talking and she interrupts to ask me something and I answered her because I heard her question. And it was not anything I could have guessed. And mm-hmm. so she's just she's just kind of like, Yeah, okay, I should I should learn. I don't have to say anything. And he's like, Yeah, he's psychic. And she goes, I know, he does it to me all the time. <laughs> And then he started thinking about it. And then finally he's like, wait, how did you know what she was going to ask? I'm like, I heard her ask it. She just didn't ask it yet. 
and it, and it kind of broke him a little bit because he really couldn't figure it out. But I think maybe <laughs> at least he probably thought, well, maybe we, we planned it just to trick him or something. Right, right. It, what is it? Uh, Occam's razor. Yeah. The yeah. simplest explanation. Yeah, I could see. I could see that either way. Um, yeah, I agree. Though I've had I've had the same exact experience experiences with my own husband. So I I believe you entirely. It uh and like I said, it's weird because it was the only you know no one else has repeated mm-hmm. that. Most of my yeah. weird experiences are not repeated. It's not like oh I had this experience eight times. No, it's I had it once. It was really weird, yeah. and then yeah. something completely different happens. Um, yeah, I agree. And, and with him, the thing the thing that finally broke him was uh, he was part of some something in Cornell where they he had signed that he would leave and go wherever they needed him to, and he was under contract. Mm-hmm. And they decided mm-hmm. they were sending him to like Wisconsin or something, and so he's like, "I'm leaving. There's nothing I can do about it. I don't want to go." But Aww. you know, and so I looked at him dead seriously and just went, "You're not going anywhere." Because I just knew with absolute certainty he wasn't leaving. And he's like getting more and more upset with me every week as the deadline for when he's leaving gets closer. And I was like, dude, you're not going anywhere. And he's like, yes, I am. They've already shipped everything. And there is nothing in the world that is going to stop this from, from, from me from leaving. And then the last week he was supposed to be at the show, he walks in and goes, how the F did you know? Mm Mm-hmm. And I turned around completely clueless. It was like, no, what? He's like, I'm not leaving. And I'm like, oh, right. Yeah. I don't know. I just knew. That's funny. Well, see, you know, if, if maybe he, he had been a little bit more open-minded, he wouldn't have had to sit there and eat that humble pie with you. <laughs> it, it was, I, I think it just, it was one of those things that, that there was no way I could have known that information. Mm-hmm. And I was so certain about it. And I, it's not even like I tried to figure it out. It just, as soon as he said he was leaving, I'm like, no, you're not. You just knew. You yeah. just knew. And, and it's stuff like that that makes me think that you were in complete attunement with the unfolding of that exact timeline. And to go back to, to time, you had said that you didn't really think that you'd ever had time slips. I consider that a time uh, anomaly or a time slip because yeah. you knew something that was out of the time at that right. moment that you couldn't have known otherwise. And same with you predicting what your what your lady friend was going to ask you or, or was thinking. So I I do think indeed Well with that I think it could have been Sai as much as Sai as much as anything else. Uh because mm-hmm. she was literally thinking of the question when I heard it. Oh so she was thinking of it right then and there. Okay. Right. Right. It wasn't like she she was going to ask in five minutes. She was forming it in her head and was about to say it and I would hear it and answer her. Gotcha. Oh man, I need another latte. <laughs> but but it's not like I could read her mind or anything. It would mm-hmm. just be questions for me that I would pick up. Okay. We got to take a quick break. We will be right back. This is our mid-show break. And first off, contact info. Everything you want can be found at wheredotheroadgo.com. All the emails, all the social media, Physical address to send stuff to, whatever you want, can be found there, as well as all shows all the way back to the beginning over 10 years ago. All right. Um, and and send us your stories. We almost have enough for a listener story show, uh, some really good ones so far. So if you have a weird experience as you'd like to share stories at wheredotheroadgo.com. So uh, my recommendation this week is a show from Q Code called Ad Lusum. And this is a podcast, an audio fiction podcast that really pushes some pretty interesting ethical questions. And uh, they do it really, really well. Um, Christopher Pine, I think, is in it as well, if I'm not mistaken. Who was, uh, was he Kirk? I think he was Kirk in the new Star Trek movies. Yeah, so it has, uh, oh, it's produced by Christopher Pine, Olivia Wilde. Um, Ian Gottler, I, I don't know who these other people are, um, Troyan Belisario and Joshua Close. So it is, yeah, it stars Christopher Pine and Olivia Wilde. It's, uh, yeah, I mean, obviously it's not an independent one, but it, it is, I don't want to give too much away. Um, it's interesting in the way that it presents these questions and, uh, there's a number of them that it presents in this, in this first season. I don't know if they're going to do more or not. There's 10 episodes. They're all about a half an hour long, but really interesting. 
It's about a tech company that's about to start pushing a uh, uh, sort of a, a you know like like an assistant. They already have sort of a holographic assistant that can teach people stuff. So it's it's a step ahead of where we are today with you know things like Siri and stuff. So it would actually and, and a lot of times it's an actual person controlling the projection so you know they can teach people stuff and do do different things and this is the point where they decide that they they now have a way of putting patches on the side of your head that will allow you to feel things as well and uh well you can kind of guess where that goes pretty quickly but again it comes down to the ethics of it all and i think they did a really good job with it so go check that out and uh yeah that's all i got for you this week so back to the show looking for something to do after halloween is over are you into the strange bizarre and unusual on november 3rd 4th and 5th the strange realities conference is coming back to nashville tennessee and streaming online come join us for three days exploring mysteries the supernatural the occult weird history and more featuring lectures presentations and workshops by tim banal zach hunt Leslin Vance, Bryn Collier, Tobias Whalen, Brent Rains, Joshua Cutchen, Kiki Dombrowski, Recluse, Nathan Isaac, Christopher Ernst, Aaron Gullius, David Metcalf, Timothy Renner, Mallory Samwitzki, Soraya Azkap, and special guest Steve Berg as your Master of Ceremonies. Make sure to join us for the fun and informative weekend online and at SIR Nashville November 3rd and 4th and online only November 5th. Tickets are available at strangerealitiesconference.com. So I am here with Tilly Treadwell on uh, Where Did the Road Go? And uh, before we go any further, t- uh, tell people where they can find you online. Uh, yes, absolutely. I, I wish that I could. <laughs> I am new to this sphere, my friends, and I do not yet have any online presence, okay. although I am working on it. And as soon as I get a website, Soraya, I will be more than happy to share it with you if you'd be so kind as to share it with our friends here. Sure. Sure, we'll have you back on. Lovely. Um, in the meantime, if anyone wants to uh, send you anything, they can always send it to me and I'll forward it along to you. That sounds lovely. Or they could also email me at talktillytome at gmail.com. Okay, that works great. Um, so, so as far as time slips, what kind of time slip experiences have you had? Hmm, that is a great topic indeed. Recently, I, I had a pretty good one. I was feeling like absolute garbage. So in the book that I'm writing with Tim, I I have a portion of it called Run In With The Onion. And <laughs> I wasn't feeling very well. So I made a classic meatloaf. And um, for me, that includes onions, cooked onions. And I just can't have them anymore. They make me terribly ill. And I don't know why. The next morning, I woke up still feeling awful. I had overslept by almost an hour. And I have a cat. Her name is Evie. She is a Maine Coon mix. And she's very particular about her breakfast. Do you have pets or cats or kids? I do. I have a a cat. Does she yell when she's hungry? No. Or he? No. No, Okay. He really doesn't make a whole lot of noise most of the time. Oh, can we, can we trade for a week? <laughs> he, wa- he, he, he needs constant attention and or treats. But other than that, he, he doesn't really make much noise. He just, he just politely taps me nonstop. Oh, that's adorable. It, well, if, if it starts out, it starts out adorable. Does it? Oh, it not so adorable after a little bit, huh? Yeah. Especially when the claws kind of get you. Oh, oh, I know. I know that failing. Well, my cat, very similar. She'll she'll tap and scream at the same time. Ah. So she'll walk up to you if the breakfast is late. She is, she is very accustomed to having her breakfast between 8 o'clock and 9 o'clock a.m. Any later than that, and she is screaming at the door. Or if you're sitting there, you know, she'd tap you. And, of course, eventually the claws come out, <laughs> snag on the pants or whatever. So I had slept in by about 45 minutes or so because I was not feeling well. I get up. And the cat is screaming at the door. And so I picked her up and I went into the kitchen and I, the, the stove has a clock and I stood there and I looked at the clock, had the cat in, in, under one arm and I put on a, an old fa- fashioned pot of coffee. And I know this 
stove, like the back of my hand, and I know this pot of coffee extremely well. I know exactly how long it takes to boil, and I know that we didn't have a storm or anything the night before, so I know that the clock is accurate on the stove and on my cell phone. I take Evie with me to the bathroom, which was like 20 feet away at most, right across from the kitchen. I can still see the stove. I can still see the clock on the stove and the the pot of water with the coffee in it. Well, I am, of course, on my throne. I'm not feeling well, not at all. And I'm in there for five minutes. I timed it on my phone and I finish up. And as I am coming out of the bathroom, I feel a very strange shift. And bizarrely, I feel almost entirely just like a whole new person. My pain, all of my symptoms are gone. My nausea is gone. Everything is gone. And I look up at the at the clock and I look at the water. The water t- takes 12 minutes to boil. I was in the bathroom for five and I could not believe it. There was no way that time had reversed. I was shocked to see that the time had reversed by about an hour. Mm. So instead of me being late for my cat's breakfast, for Her Majesty's breakfast, I was actually perfectly on time, perfectly on time. And my coffee was boiling perfectly on time. And I was feeling extremely well, like I hadn't even had those nasty onions last night. So I looked at my phone and I just could not believe it at all. And it was just the, it was the absolute strangest morning that entire morning. And my cat was still very upset. She was still acting as though I had overslept and not fed her. She Mm. ate so voraciously that morning that she threw up on the carpet (laughs) because she was so hungry. And she only does that if her breakfast is an hour or so later than what it should be. (laughs) And yet, apparently, I I was perfectly on time. Perhaps, instead of moving in time, you moved in realities. And that's something else that I I think happened. I really do think that I switched entire storylines, entire timelines. I really do. And I think I took my cat with me. Yeah, I was going to (laughs) say. You you, you were so frustrated. Yep. Hmm, That's an interesting one. I'm not sure what I would do with that. Right. I didn't know what to do with it either, except to write Tim about it, tell him about it, and then write a chapter about it. <laughs> that's that's the best therapy that I could think for the situation. Um, you know, you get you get missing time reports in uh, UFO g- encounters and stuff, and there's always this assumption that something happened that we don't remember. But I, I, I am of the opinion that it's very possible that no, we just moved in time in a weird way. Mm-hmm. It's it's like I, I agree. Yeah. It's it's not so much that the time is missing, it's just time changed how it how we experienced it. I, I agree a hundred percent. And my husband, Thames, he's he's had missing time quote unquote experiences with me as well. Mm. So yeah. so you've had flat out missing time experiences. Yeah. Yep. Quite a few times actually. We've we've had them together. Oddly enough, I think the only time I've had missing time has been with him. Now okay. that I think about it. So so what happened? But, um, we would just we would just notice we'd turn around and notice that neither of us could quote unquote remember where we'd been for the last ten minutes. We would just notice that the clock was different than what it should have been, or that suddenly he was running late for work or something. Mm. I mean, pretty mundane, but I, <laughs> it's I, something, I guess. I've, I've had that experience a lot, but it's usually because I get caught up doing things. Yes. We were not, it was not like that for us. <laughs> Actually, that, that happened today to me, to me today, where I just got caught up and suddenly I looked at the clock and went, how is it 530? There's no way it's 530. It's 530. Okay, great. <laughs> That, that is true. That does definitely happen to me, too. But these these experiences feel different. Yeah. We usually feel buzzy right okay. after we've had an experience like that. That's something that we keep noticing in a lot of these different types of experiences. Um, and we, we've even had whole objects appear out of nowhere oh. with some of these experiences. So, so you've had apports. Not, hmm? Apports. I, I, I don't know. That I would call them apports. Okay. I know what you're talking about. I don't think that I would call them that though, because I suspect 
that we caught a timeline shift while okay. it was happening. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you, you want to give people a, a description of one of these? Yeah, sure thing. Um, my husband and I moved into this, this cozy little cottage about three years ago. And while we were moving in, getting everything unpacked, we had a set of large gray bins, you know, like the Rubbermaid bins that you can get from Walmart or yep. whatever have you. And we needed them because we had all of our kitchen utensils in one of these bins. We tore the place apart looking for these bins. We looked in the garage. We looked in the car. We looked in everything. Searched the whole house. Could not find them. He and I were standing in our bare kitchen, just surrounded by, by cardboard boxes otherwise, and talking about how we could not find these bins. So he and I were standing in the middle of the kitchen, and we were talking face-to-face -face about it facing somewhat away from where the bins appeared. We were talking about how we could not find these bins and how important it was that we find them and how we don't know where they could be. We turn around to go decide to, to like research the whole house and everything. We mutually trip over literally the, the two bins that we were looking for stacked neatly on top of each other, right at shin level. <laughs> how could we miss that? They weren't warm by any chance, were they? <laughs> I, I, I don't think that they were, to be honest. I don't remember them being that way. Uh, but we also did have the AC cranking. So well, I think mean, it gets pretty hot in Florida. I'm, I'm asking because a lot of times apported objects are warm. Yes, they are. There's a, there's a temperature differential. Neither of us, from what I'm recalling, remember them being warm at all. They just so, felt so normal. It was you that shifted, not them. That's what I'm thinking. Maybe, or it could have been them. I don't really know. I... I have no idea. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Do you, do you get sleep paralysis? Nope. I've never had that before. Oh, well, you're lucky. Um, when, when you say, I, I, I meant to ask you this prior, um, when you say the, that you get that buzzing feeling, what is that? Um, it's mostly in my head. Not like I'm mentally imagining it. I feel it in my, my face, my jaw, and then my ears and my whole head. Like energy vibrating. Yeah. Okay. Does it feel and electrical? Sometimes does it does it feel electrical? You know, I've never I've never had the experience of getting getting shocked or sticking a fork in the outlet. <laughs> so I I'm, I'm not sure to be honest with you. Well, like the, like like think more like static electricity. Oh, okay. No, it's not like that. Okay. It's it's deeper. It's deeper and it feels it feels like often it's starting deep inside me and then vibrating out. Oh, huh, okay. Yeah. Do you, do you ever find yourself affecting electronics? <laughs> yeah, when I when I was younger, especially, but not so much anymore. Okay. What happened mm -hmm. when you were younger? Like would you crash computers, knock light bulbs out? Yeah. Stuff like that and then also uh fried a, a few vacuums oh. allegedly. Allegedly? I was accused of it. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I, I don't know. Maybe I did. Maybe I didn't. Maybe it was just a bad coincidence. I don't know. So it happened multiple times. It did. It did. And people were not happy. <laughs> yeah. It, th yep. then, uh, I was going to say there's more expensive stuff you could fry. Right. Yeah. Um, it, it happened when I was, when I was a preteen and a teenager for the most part. And then as I got older, it just kind of petered out, I guess. I mean, there there have been a few instances, but I found that it seems to have happened at, when I'm closer to this age. It's only happened when I've been extremely upset. Yeah. So um, there was one there was one incident at the last house that we lived in. I was terribly upset. Things just were it was just a rough period. And you know how it can be being a business owner and whatnot. Um, I was having a very difficult day and that day, whether it was me or not, the AC, the whole house AC went out and then <laughs> there were issues with the lights and the stove. And this was a brand new house, <laughs> freshly wired, never should have happened. The landlords sent out their professional maintenance team. They were great guys, truly great guys. But he walked over, he was testing the stove, and he noticed that he would turn the knob on the stove, 
and the light across the room would flick on and off with like in sync to what he was doing with the stove. And it got to the point, I think he was indeed like Catholic or Christian. He crossed himself (laughs) right there in the house. And he, (laughs) well, you think it's funny. I actually feel, I feel bad for this guy. Oh my gosh. So he called his supervisor right in front of me. He put his supervisor on video chat and he said, and he's like, sir, I have to show you this. I don't know what to do. I've never seen this before. And I, I, I need your professional opinion before I do anything else. And the, the supervisor's like, okay, well, well, it can't be that bad, right? Just show me. So he flips on the video call and he points it at the oven and he goes, watch, watch this knob. You see this knob, right? I'm clicking it. You see that I'm doing this right now. And then he looks over to the light and he shows them. He shows him there's no one over by the light, right? And supervisor's like, yeah, no one is over there. He turns back to the stove, puts his hand on there, shows the supervisor, and he said, watch what happens when I flick this knob. So he shows him that he's got the hand on the knob, and then he slowly pans it back over to the light, and he flicks on the knob, shows him turning on the light, (laughs) and then flicks it on and off and on and off. And he says, sir, this is literally impossible and I don't know what to do. So the supervisor advised him, uh, go work on the air conditioning. That's not our problem. <laughs> and so he he stepped outside for a few moments with the supervisor where I couldn't hear them. When he came back, though, he told me that he had called the landlord, let the landlord know he doesn't know what to do about it. The landlord is going to handle it personally, and um, I hope you have a great day. And I've never seen a man <laughs> so nervous in my presence. Oh, that's a, that's yeah. an awesome story. Thank you. <laughs> although, although I assume it was an electric uh, stove. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was. My first, fir- like, like, I, granted, there's no reason it should be turning the light on in the other room, but I'd be worried about an electrical fault somewhere. Mm-hmm. Even if it doesn't seem like it should be, it's like, okay, something has screwed something up and now the stove is turning on the light. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so the land, the landlords had a, a specialist come out and inspect the whole house within like a day. And what was really interesting is that the specialist was like, there is nothing wrong here and I have no idea how the stove could turn on the light. And that person must have been mistaken. And I just, I didn't say anything because I saw it with my own eyes. Yeah. And it stopped doing it after a while. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Interesting. Good times. (laughs) (laughs) I I, I had a girl, a girlfriend that anytime she got up, got really upset, she would fry electronics around her like severely. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) Numerous Mm -hmm. times she would, and for some reason, particularly I've had more issues with like foreign cars. Uh, mm. So like Volkswagens or stuff like that have always given me more problems uh, with mm. my electrical sensitivity or interference syndrome, whatever people want to call it. Um, yeah. But she, we had a Volkswagen at the time and like she would get upset about something and the car would just die. Aww. And it would be like, and just, like I just remember one time because it was like six o'clock in the morning and it was freezing out and she got upset about something and the car just quit. And she's like, she just drops her head down. She's like, I'm sorry. Oh, <laughs> what did you do? You gassed her up and now she killed your car. Oh, no. she, she, and the thing is, my mechanic would come get the car. He'd look the whole thing over, be like, I don't know why this won't stop, start. Mm-hmm. He'd leave it for a couple of days, go out, and it would just start up like there was never anything wrong with it. Yep, yep. And so like, what happened there? Did it really die and come back, or did you and your lady friend switch timelines, or you know, what was it? I, 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 so I suspect we, we charged the car in some way. Gotcha. So you think it was more electrical? Yes. Oh, we definitely. Gotcha. She had experiences where like the, all the wiring above her desk at work uh, all started, like almost started a fire, like the stuff that was you, up up above the ceiling. I've never had that. Anything that I've had a problem with, it just shuts down. That's it. Right, right. And we we, we had a laptop. I mean, this this is late 90s. We had a laptop. Um, so fairly, you know, like running Windows 95 or 98 or something. Mm-hmm. And uh, if one of us handed it to the other, it just locked up. Oh, wow. Like every you- single time. We learned we had to put it down and then let the other one pick it up. Interesting. 
So do you think that that's related to the Kundalini yes. that you were talking yeah, about Yes, almost earlier? certainly. Okay, okay. And the buzzing you're so, talking about could also be a, a symptom of Kundalini. It could be. You're absolutely right. Buzzing electricity, they, they seem to go hand in hand a lot of yeah. time. Yeah. Hmm. So I'll, I'll, I'll send you a show on Kundalini so you can see if anything matches up with your experiences. Yeah, please do. I would actually love to, to listen to whatever you'd have to send me. It, it seems like um, there's a lot that I could pick up on there, and I'd love to share it with you. The um, And the thing is, Kundalini itself is just a convenient word for the energy, I think. Um, okay. You know, I've seen churches, you know, when they're mm -hmm. filled with the Holy Spirit, it's kind of like, and eh, this is the same thing as Kundalini. Okay. You know, uh, I've, I've illustrated there are laughing churches, um, and that's one of the things Kundalini can do is cause you to laugh uncontrollably for no reason. Interesting. And you can spread it to people. I've had this experience where I grab a hold of someone. It's almost always a girlfriend and they'll start laughing and it's like, yep, this literally just spreads from one person to another. And then you watch these videos of these laughing churches. And mm -hmm. the first guy will start, and then he'll grab a hold of someone, and they'll start laughing, and then they'll grab a hold of someone, and they'll start laughing. And it's kind of like, so this could very well just be Kundalini, you know. But again, it's just a term. So I mean, it's it's whatever you whatever you know, whatever it is, it's the same energy. Okay, yeah. Just calling it energy that makes more sense to me. That's that's kind of how I I see electricity and even what I do know about kundalini it just seems to me like energy just all energy it, so so it is all energy um but kundalini is is very specific in certain things okay okay so i mean it's it's a sanskrit word um and you know there's kundalini yoga to specifically raise it hmm. so i mean okay. it, but but at the same time it also is just energy it's just a, if, it's a very it's a more potent form of energy and honestly, it feels like something other than you, even though you kind of know it's you. Oh, okay. Do you think that it could be called kind of like the spirit essence of a person concentrated or? Could be. Okay. It's definitely, like I said, it's definitely electrical in nature. So, hmm. but, and it doesn't wake up on everyone, but it does spread. Actually, so does sleep paralysis, interestingly enough. That was why I was asking about sleep paralysis. Uh, mm -hmm. there's a, there's a good documentary out. Uh, what is it? We did a couple of shows on it. I think it was called the nightmare or something like mm -hmm. that. And it was, uh, they interviewed different people with different types of sleep paralysis. And there's a lot of electrical stuff going on there. Mm -hmm. Uh, but also people who didn't have sleep paralysis and then, you know, started dating someone who did, and then they started having sleep sleep paralysis yes I, I i'm quite familiar um in my in my younger years although i'm retired now i did work as a professional intuitive and uh spiritual advisor and a tarot interpreter and whatnot and one of the biggest issues that my clientele faced were what i t i call lifestyle issues and vibrational issues and they were living in sometimes very poor unhealthy ways unbalanced ways and then they would have an accumulation of things like um shadow people apparitions and sleep paralysis mm -hmm. and then i i did have like you were saying i had some couples that would come to me and one partner they didn't have any issues like that until they got with this one person and it absolutely does spread and do i do i think that it's all in someone's head absolutely not not yeah. from what i've seen and that's the thing if it was just a, a something in someone's head it's not mm -hmm. going to spread there's nothing to spread exactly i mean is it possible that the scientific explanation of oh your brain's waking up but your body's not and that and it's just still in a dream state yeah that's certainly some of the time that's what's happening i'm sure oh yeah uh, yeah but you know, there's also those those other experiences and the fact that it, you that's not something you should be able to spread to someone else. Oh, yeah, I agree. And and when I was advising people, I would have people come in and do my little questionnaire and whatnot. And some of these people I caught on after a few years of advising, some of these people were just as as strange as it may sound. They had nutritional deficiencies 
combined with too much stress mm-hmm. and their their hormones and their their sleeping schedules were just out of whack and that's what was causing them to have these sleep paralysis issues and so i would advise them on correcting those deficiencies and lessening their stress and fixing their schedule and then they would come back to me and they would say you know what as long as i follow this routine right here that you helped me put together, I'm absolutely fine. I'm not having any more issues here whatsoever. But then there were other people who had come in who would have very similar problems going on at night, the sleep paralysis, sometimes seeing the shadow creatures and shadow people and whatnot. And they had much deeper issues going on where malnutrition issues, fixing that, it's not going to solve the problem. Yeah. Getting on a sleep schedule, giving them a set bedtime and um, trying them out on some melatonin and some nice herbal tea, that's not going to cut it. They've got a lot more going on there. And then it can also spread. So that tells me, at least this is my interpretation, that seems to say to me that it's there are varied causes for this type of phenomenon, physical, spiritual, vibrational, or a mix of all of it. I believe that every single situation is unique, but that all of it's real. Yes. If it makes sense. All right. We are out of time. If you don't mind sticking around for a Patreon, we can talk about a few other things. Sure. My pleasure. And uh, tell people, give people your email again. They want to get a hold um, of you. Sure. So my email address is talktilly to me at gmail.com. And my name is spelled T-I-L-L-I-E. So that's talktilly to me at gmail.com. Funny enough, my email address is its literally just <laughs> a play on words. The old song, uh, Talk Dirty to Me. <laughs> oh, from Poison, yes. Yes, yes. I love old me. Oh, God, goodness. Not old. I love classic, classic music. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. And we'll continue this on our Patreon segment. Yes, sir. I want to give a shout out here to all of my patrons. It is because of you that this show is possible. And I want to give a shout out to those pledging $10 or more. Greg Ross, Bill Luminati, Leanne Cherry, Matt in Delaware, Allison Cook, Super Inframan, 36 Dingo, Tim, Andrew Nichols, Matthew Sproul, Christine, a blue second gen MR2 drifting around a Japanese mountain, Patricia Guy Quinta, Alex Whitcomb, American Rambler, Andrew Maines, Ann Witowski, Barbara Fisher, Beverly Williamson, Big Boy Limina, Bright Rectangle, Charles Davis, Charles in Florida, the head of the crazy and communicable, CJ, Craig Parmenter, Diane B, MTK, Eric Citron, Eric Todd, History and Coffee, Jay, Jay Otto Bullet, Jack Huntington, James Lindsay, Jim and Sophie, John Mattingly, John Bracken, Carla Mahoney, Kevin, Kevin Shrek, Cool Kitty, Kristen L, Laser Printer Jam, Lauren McLean, Linda, Linz Jackson K, MJ Armstrong, Mark Brady, Mr. Weird, Oli Andre Olar, Paul Jeffries, Philosopher of Mirrors, Riker and Stark, Ron Dupre, Sam Sharon, Schmooples, Devourer of Mortal Souls, Andrew Malone, Stacy Sherwood, Strange Stories with the Seeker and Skeptic Podcast. Tactical Therapist, Taylor Bell, Thunderboy, Tyler Glimstead, Varosh K, Vincent Trewell, Will Gebhard, Will Powell, Ren Collier, Annabelle Smith, Caroline Walker, TDT Skunkworks, A Crocodile, and Craig Sagastumi. Thank you all so very, very much. So as we said at the end of that, Tilly did a uh, Patreon segment with me, which will be up for Patreons uh, very, very soon. And uh, if you're not a patron, it's only $3 a month, and you get extra content almost every single week, and it helps me out greatly. It helps the show out greatly. I mean, it's what keeps everything going. So you get some special surprises in there, too. Okay. Shout out to a couple of new patrons, Andrew Malone and Timothy Sturgeon. Thank you guys for coming on board, and I will see you next time. You have been listening to Where Did the Road Go? This show is made possible in part from our Patreons, and we thank you and everyone listening for helping us continue this exploration of the strange. You can always find everything Where Did the Road Go related at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. 
and thank you so much for your support.